double-mindedness. When given the clear opportunity to acknowledge the one true God, we should realize that our silence may indicate the degree of unbelief in our lives. Here's Dr. Gene Getz to explain. To understand this principle as it grows out of the life of Elijah, I think we really need to review uh, what has happened to him uh, this far as we, we look at this dramatic story. First of all, uh, let's look at Elijah's prophetic pronouncement. Uh, in 1 Kings 17, 1, uh, where he marched in and said to Ahab, there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. Next, we see God's command to Elijah. Now, this is after three years have passed. And we read this in 1 Kings 18, 1. Go and present yourself to Ahab. I will send rain on the surface of the land. And that was a great command and a great challenge. And we see then uh, next Elijah's challenge to Ahab, 1 Kings 18, 19. Now summon all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, it's interesting. The challenge was from the Lord that uh, Ahab was supposed to meet on that mountain, Mount Carmel, with the 450 prophets of Baal. But he also uh, was to command the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table, to be there. The fact is, as the story unfolds, those 400 prophets of Asherah never showed up. And you can imagine what happened. You can imagine Jezebel. I mean, she had a fit. And she said, no way am I sending my prophets. You can send your prophets, but not my prophets. Because they didn't show up. But the 450 prophets of Baal did. And there we find, once they got to Mount Carmel, and many of you in this room have been on Mount Carmel, and uh, with my wife and I, I always love that experience to be there on that mountain, overlook the Jezreel Valley, and, and to realize, as we actually could sit right there on these rocks, that it all happened right there on Mount Carmel. But once these people gathered, the children of Israel gathered, and I often try to imagine what it would be like with all these people gathered there at the foot of the mountain, and Elijah cries out, probably in a, a booming voice, to all the people of Israel. And here we read about that in 1 Kings 18.21. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? Now remember, he's speaking to the children of Israel. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow Him. And then he went on to say, here's the other opinion. But if Baal follow him, but the people didn't answer him a word. Now, let's remember that the principle here has to do with silence. And sometimes silence really speaks in terms of unbelief. They didn't respond. There was silence. Well, the story unfolds. It's an incredible dramatic story. One of the most dramatic stories in the whole Old Testament. Where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal. All of these prophets up there. And he says, go ahead. You, uh, you take uh, a bull. In fact, I'll pick out the bull and give him to you so you don't realize that or think that there's some trick here. You take the bull, look at it, put it on the offering, and ask God to come down, start a fire, burn up this sacrifice to Baal. And we read that they, they went through all kinds of cantations, cutting themselves, shouting uh, most of the day, crying out to Baal. Well, you know, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And then Elijah said, okay. Uh, he rebuilt the altar that had been torn down, the altar to God. And uh, he dug a trench around it. And he put the wood on there, and uh, then he poured water all over it. 
and put the bowl there, poured water on it again, third time, water again, soaked it, and then he just stepped forward and he said, not with all of this uh, paraphernalia that surrounded all the stuff that they were doing and all the incantations, he just simply said, God, Show these people who you are. In essence, that's what he said. And the fire came down, and it was just incredible what happened. Burned everything up. Not only burned up the sacrifice, burned up the rocks, lapped up all of, of the, the water that was soaking in that trench. It was an incredible miracle. And here now is Israel's response to this situation. 1 Kings eighteen thirty nine. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, Yahweh, He is God. Yahweh, He is God. That's how they responded to this great miracle. Now, obviously, what we see here is double-mindedness on the part of Israel. We see silence representing their unbelief. But as I think about that, I think about the fact that, you know, we're all human. And I think we all face that. And I think Paul illustrates that himself, the internal conflict that Paul himself had. We read about this in Romans 7.19. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, that's inner conflict. That's conflict. That's double-mindedness. Now, that was the temptation. But I think a lot of times uh, Christians reading that passage say, yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's double-mindedness. But they forget to read on and go into chapter 8 of the book of Romans. Because they're the double-mindedness, though it exists at times, though we have inner conflict, that's normal. There's an ultimate solution. And we read about it in Romans 8.1. You see, he's building a story here. He's saying, I have inner conflict, but... Here's the resolve. Here's the answer to that inner conflict. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. In other words, the resolution to our inner conflict that will exist is to walk in the Spirit, rather to be uh, under condemnation of that law of sin and death that pulls us down. There is freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ from that inner conflict. And uh, though we face it, there is resolution as we live our lives and grow and mature in Jesus Christ. So the reflection response question is this. What are some specific reasons some of us live conflicted lives when it comes to making choices between right and wrong? Well, the answer to that, I think, first and foremost, that we need to acknowledge up front, and that is we're all sinners. You know, even though we're believers, we're still human. Uh, we still uh, have temptations. And secondly, we live in a world that, that has temptations everywhere around us. They're there, and they're going to cause us to be conflicted. Uh, there's another reason, and certainly this relates back to the children of Israel, though it applies to us, and that is that we just not have presented ourselves to the Lord. We haven't chosen who we're going to serve. Uh, we're halting between two opinions. Uh, we're trying to straddle the fence, as it were. Uh, we're trying to live on one side of the fence or on the other side of the fence. We're trying to walk the line with a foot on one side, a foot on the other side. And so we stay in a state of, of confliction in that sense. We're, in other words, still walking in the flesh, as believers rather than walking in the Spirit. But I think God has given us a plan, and it's a process that we all go through, a plan to avoid living a double-minded life. And, and here is what it is. It's Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and we all, many of us, know these verses by memory. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, and there the term brothers is certainly generic. Many times the word brothers, it's translated from a Greek term that we don't have an English word for it, uh, but it's generic in this sense. Therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, in view of what God has done for you, I urge you to 
First of all, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You see, the children of Israel were actually serving uh, the Baals. They were serving false gods. And they had left presenting themselves, themselves to God. And what, what Paul is saying here, now that we live in the full light of God's revelation in Jesus Christ and His resurrection, we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And then he defines that. Holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. This is a process, you see, in our Christian lives. Do not be conformed to this age. The children of Israel were conformed to the world system in their day. And they had not become transformed in following God and being obedient. So Paul says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there we see this is a process. Daily, renewing our minds, living in this world, but not being controlled by this world and conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And here is what happens as a result of that. Paul says, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So I believe that that's God's plan, you see, to avoid living a double-minded life. And so here's the principle. Let's not forget it. Right from uh, this life of Elijah. When given a clear opportunity to acknowledge the one true God, we should realize that our silence may indicate the degree of unbelief in our lives. Let's not be silent. Let's move forward in our confession of Jesus Christ, who He is, so that we might conform our lives to Him rather than to this world.